So without going too deep into this, but I, want, I always emphasize with electrical, there is no room for bravado or MacGyverism. You, perfection is the only sort of like being an accountant. Good enough is never good enough as an accountant. It's a precise business. Being an electrician is the same thing. So it's essential that every connection you do has to be perfect. If it isn't perfect, you have to redo it. Doing 90% of your boat perfectly is irrelevant. The 10% are is enough to make the connection potentially be a source of heat and a fire. So with that, um, it's really essential to do it right. And that's what Gareth is gonna try to demonstrate today. And we're gonna be showing you with all the tools that we brought. So obviously you're gonna be choosing a lot of different sizes of panels and you've got a lot of choice. All of the solar panels being rigid or flexible are gonna have what are called MC4 connectors. MC4 connectors are connectors, and we'll show that, that can be done and undone that provide a really good seal to be outside. Because at the end of the day, think about a solar panel on your boat is gonna have some sort of connection to interconnect the solar panel to the cabling or the solar wiring. Those cabling have to be done outside. So it's gonna be out in the elements. For instance, on my boat, I've had my solar array installed for five and a half years, and I have solar connections that are out in the elements 365 days a year, and right now they're probably practically underwater with the amount of rainwater we're getting, and they're out there and they've gotta be able to never corrode, or so you've gotta have a really good seal, and Gareth is gonna be showing that. So when you're thinking about doing a solar installation on your boat, there's gonna be what are all the different things you're gonna be looking at? You're gonna be looking at obviously having a solar panel or many solar panels. The terminals at the solar panel are gonna be MC4 connectors and we're gonna be demonstrating that. You absolutely need to have what's called an outdoor rated cable. Um, even though it's only a gauge 10 cable, the shield or the, not the shield, but the, um, God, I'm just gapping here. Um, the, the jacket of the wire is actually double sized on a marine cable. So if you look at a marine wire for solar, you're gonna look at the cable and you're gonna think it looks like a gauge eight wire. But in reality, the jacket is almost double the size. Inside is only a gauge 10. And why that's relevant or is that when you start installing on an MC4 connector, they're assuming that the wire going into that connector is gonna be a solar wire. If it's a normal, gauge 10 wire, you'll never be, be able to make a good seal. So it's guaranteed water will get in. So the only way to guarantee a good seal with using an MC4 is to absolutely use a solar wire going in that because that is double jacketed cable. And you'll see we've got solar cabling down here. You'll see the difference. It's a much thicker jacket around the wire. The other thing too is obviously your solar panels are on the outside. You're gonna have to find some sort of way to go inside the boat. And going inside the boat is gonna to have to be done some sort of way. How are you gonna do that? You might put a cable clam, you might, there's different blue seas and different companies do these uh, cable systems where there's absolutely no water. You can even mount them on a deck and it's a rubber that you drill a hole through and as you screw it down, it tightens down so no water. Because you've gotta make sure obviously, and especially in this climate, it's gonna rain. And if you've got a cable that you just put Sikaflex to stop the water from coming in, that's not gonna work. So you need to have a really good idea and on when we do installations on, our, on all our boat, the boats that we deal with, we always make sure there's a drip loop. So as the water kind of like gets on the cable and goes down, we make sure that the water goes back, hits the bow, goes back inside. We never run a cable directly from a bimini straight into a cable clam because what's gonna happen, it's gonna become always constantly being hit with rainwater that's gonna kind of adhere to the cable as it goes down and then you're just gonna be constantly having water pushing trying to get in. A drip loop is a really good idea. Inside the boat, then you can change via a terminal block easily to a gauge 10 wire. Marine, right? Which is gonna be less money, smaller, and you can do that inside on a terminal block. But on the outside of the boat, and because the connection is going to an MC4 connection, you have to have solar wiring that is gauge 10. The next thing that you're gonna have, and I'm gonna show you that a little bit later in a few slides, is what's called the controller. There's two types of controllers. There's what's called PWM controllers or MPPT controllers. We strongly advise that you use what's called an MPPT controller. MPPT controllers are about 98% inefficient, efficient, i.e. you lose about 
at PWM is about 21% inefficient. So you're gonna lose, if you buy a 100 watt solar array and you have a PWM controller, you bought it off eBay and it's much cheaper than MPPT and you think you scored a deal, sort of like going to McDonald's and think, why would I ever buy more than a $4 meal? I'm so smart. Well, you're not getting a full meal. You're getting a $4 meal, right? So there's reasons why you wanna pay more and your 100 watt solar array is suddenly gonna give you only ever maximum of maybe 79 watts. So you're just discarding 20 watts off your solar array because you chose a PWM controller. So it's essential, and I've got a lot of boat owners that have an existing array, have an existing PWM, and if they want to increase their capacity for solar array, the first thing to do is just change the controller. You get suddenly a 25% gain of your solar array. You go from 80 to 100 almost instantly by just changing the controller. And the last bit, and this is absolutely critical, is that when any times you do a connection to a battery, you have to have a fuse connection at the battery. So your controller, and I'll show you a diagram, your controller is gonna be connected to the battery and also connected to the solar panels. There has to be a fuse at the start of the circuit, and the start of the circuit is the battery, not the solar panel. A solar panel will never output more than it's meant to. A battery has endless power, it can weld. So if you remember, there's different choices. Like in our business, we've got about six different lines of solar panels. You know, there's rigid and there's flexible and there's all choices within flexible. If you look at doing a, and I'm not a canvas person, but there's ways of mounting a solar panel onto different sorts of canvas. You can mount them with zippers, Velcro, grommets, snaps. Some owners simply use a grommets and they'll use a bungee. They don't want anything permanent. They're not really committed. They take it on, take it off. Some power boat owners or even sailboat owners that have hard tops are gonna use actually a self-adhesive backing in the back of the panel. They'll actually glue them on. So I've done that on Sea Rays, Tierras, Brady Whites, and on sailboaters that actually have a hard a Bimini or a hard dodger. You know, the, I think it's Tartuga, you know, the hard dodger. Some owners, it's very thin shell. They'll actually glue their solar panels with self-adhesive peel and stick backing right onto the, the dodger. When it comes to wiring your solar panels, you're gonna have a choice. Obviously, if you have a single solar panel, it's pretty easy. It's a single solar panel to controller to batteries. But you might on your boat have two panels, three panels, four panels. Assuming you don't have shading, right? Imagine you're putting it on top of your bimini on your power boat and there is no radar mass higher and it's always gonna evenly see the sun. You could wire your panels either in series or in parallel, but I would prefer to see series because in series, at least the advantage is the amperage stays the same all the way to the controller. You're just gonna have a higher voltage. So if you've got four panels that are outputting 20 volts each and you put them in series, the voltage, sort of like two golf carts in series, goes six volts plus six volts equals 12 volts. Well, you could have 20 volts, 20 volts, 20 volts, 20 volts. You'll have 80 volts going on the cable and the amperage is gonna stay the same. Once it gets to the controller, the controller is gonna modify the high voltage, bring it down to what the battery needs, which might be 13 volts, and then suddenly the amperage is gonna be calculated. So remember, P equals VI, so if you bring the voltage down by 10, the amperage is gonna go up by 10, right? So there's inverse correlation between current and voltage. I emphasize series because it's a way to offset voltage drop on a boat. Um, Especially with DC circuits, the big issue that we have is the further something is from the battery, the more you're gonna lose of power. And so if you can harness all that energy and the energy that's at the solar panel and bring it instantly to the batteries without losing five or 10% because of voltage drop, why wouldn't you do that? And voltage drop is offset by higher voltages. So the higher the voltage, the better it is. This is another little schematic of what a typical solar panel install looks like. You see in this instance on the left side, there's a positive, a negative cable going to positive, a negative cable going to positive, and there's only two cables coming back. So that's the other advantage of doing, in this installation, you actually have only two wires going to the Bimini, to the Dodger, wherever you're bringing it. And those two cables are gonna actually bring three solar panels down. So it's one way to do that. 
And then you'll see as well, there's gonna be two connections going to the controller and then two connections going to the batteries. It's essential in this diagram, they did not put the fuse at the right place. The fuse is gonna need to be right at the battery. So it can be anywhere in the circuit. A fuse is always located at the source of most power. If two batteries are connected in parallel over a long distance, you actually need a fuse at both ends. But in this instance, because the solar panels are only rated at whatever they're rated, a 100 watt panel will never give you 500 watts. It can never fail and give you more. Right? It's only going to fail in failure. It's not going to fail and give you more. The battery has way more power than 100 watts. So this cable might be only able to handle 30 amps, but if you have a dead short, it could actually, there's no resistance on a wire per se. It could maybe want to run 1,000 amps on that wire. So it's essential to have a fuse at the beginning of the circuit located at the battery. And also do not be tempted to ever bring the MPPT controller wiring to a switch or a panel and put it on a breaker. All charging sources on a boat have to be directly connected to the battery. All. You never want to be able to disconnect a load or charging circuit and have other loads connected to it. There's a lot of reason, it probably takes me 10 minutes to explain, but the, the end result is all chargers on your boat, alternator, battery charger, methanol, fuel cell, whatever it is, solar controller, wind turbine, all of those go to a place called the unswitched positive distribution or directly to the battery if you don't have a lot of circuits so that no matter what you turn the switch on or off, the solar panel is still connected to the battery. The next thing is I'm showing you a little bit of diagram and you'll see that cable. Um, you can buy MC4 cables connected directly onto the jacket and the large outdoor rated solar wiring. It's all black, which is nice because it makes it neater, honestly. White cabling on your boat or red or yellow. It's not necessarily what you want to see on the outside. Then what you have is you've got MC4 connectors and I've got some on the table and that's what Gareth is going to be demonstrating. Demonstrating how to actually install that connector onto a solar cable. And here you've got, and, and this is key, luckily the solar panels don't have two male connections or two female connections. It's a male and a female. Meaning once you've actually ride the right polarity, as you remove on and off the panel, you'll never have to worry about mix matching those connectors. Male will only ever go on female and female ever go on male. So it's kind of foolproof, right? And um, so it makes it easy for removing or reinstalling the panel. You have two polarities of cables that are going directly out of the panel. And when you connect onto the controller, you're gonna have also opposite polarity. So you can never mix and match because you would not want to mix positive to negative or negative to positive that would blow up the panel and that's happened to some of our owners that actually did it themselves and they inverted the polarity installing it and the panel was damaged and they had to buy another panel I talked about this a little bit earlier there's a significant difference between a PWM controller and MPPT controller an MPPT controller is sort of like a smart battery charger and why that's important is because the sun is going to output more at noon than in the morning and your batteries might be full by one o'clock. The controller actually knows what the battery voltage is and it knows what it's been doing over time, sort of like a battery charger, and it's constantly adjusting the voltage to optimally charge that battery. Because the sun might be outputting way more voltage than the battery needs at any given time. Like on my boat, I have six controllers on my boat and my batteries in the summer might be charged with a battery charger and each of the controllers has to say, wait, stop, I don't need to do anything. The batteries are full and even though it's noon and the sun is shining, it's gonna say, you know what, we don't need to convert solar power to battery power. Let's open the circuit and we're not gonna harness the sun energy right now. So it's constantly adjusting the output to the battery depending on what the battery needs. Here's an example of a controller, 7515. The other thing, when you buy a controller, remember that not all controllers are the same. There are really four things you're gonna look for when you buy a controller. One is gonna be, what's my battery bank size, uh, voltage? Do I have a 24 volt boat, 12 volt boat, 32 volt boat, 48 volt boat, it's possible. 
you're going to decide a controller that's matched to your battery bank, nominal voltage. Then you're going to have to say, <coughs> depending on the size of array that I have, what is the maximum amperage that I will have coming, not from the solar panels, but after it leaves the controller for the batteries? Am I going to get 10 amps, 15 amps, 20 amps, 100 amps? You're going to have to buy a controller that is going to be able to convert whatever voltage and amperage is coming from the panels to the amperage and voltage that your batteries need. So for instance, in this picture here, the 75 is voltage, meaning it can take an array up to 75 volts. So let's say three, I don't know, 125 watt panels. And the maximum amperage is 15. So it could handle high voltage, but it's not going to be able three 125 watt panels would be exceeding the 15 amp rating. So you would need a larger controller. And there's a controller that does 100 watts and 30 amps. So you need to make sure that when you purchase your controller, you purchase a controller that is exactly matched to the array that you're putting on your boat. And this is an important takeaway because many boat owners come to us and say, and I always know why they're doing it, but they're, they've been misled. They say, Jeff, I only want one controller on my boat. I'm like, okay, great. And it sounds like it would make sense. Why buy two things if you only need one? But the reality is the controller that does double the amperage, right? Let's say if 75, 15 and a, or 130, the 130 controller is not the same price as the 75, 15. It's double the price because it does double the amount of amperage. So it's not like you can buy the largest controller on earth for the same price that you can buy the smallest controller on earth. A controller is priced on the amperage and the voltage that goes to it. So there is not a lot of savings for a boat owner to say, I'm gonna wire 10 solar panels or five solar panels into a controller. You're not buying just one controller versus five. You're buying a controller that is sized for five panels and therefore it's gonna be a lot more expensive than only one controller. And why that's important because then you have to wonder, well, maybe if I have four solar panels, maybe I can put two on port, two on starboard and have redundancy and have two controllers. And two controllers is probably gonna be just slightly more money than one large controller. And then you have your port panels and your starboard panels that if you lose a controller, you'd only lose half of your array, not the whole array. And then the last takeaway is that you've got to ask yourself, what type of battery bank capacity do you have on your boat? Is your battery bank flooded, lead acid? Is it gel, lead acid? Is it AGM, lead acid? Is it lithium? Is it Firefly? Is it custom? And so there are controllers, like the one that I'm gonna show you here, the 7515, where you can actually go in there and set the parameters to do whatever profile of battery chemistry you want. And if you have a $100 inexpensive battery, it doesn't really maybe matter to you. But if you bought a battery bank for $1,000 or $2,000 or $500, you might be better suited with having a controller that is perfectly specified. The specifications for that controller are meant to handle the exact battery chemistry that you have on your boat. So for instance, we're selling a lot of Firefly batteries these days. Some owners are buying controllers you can go into that controller and via USB, you can go in there and say, I want to create a custom profile and I create a custom profile for the Firefly battery. So I will charge that battery exactly the, wants, the, the, the way it wants to be charged. And why that's important is because over time, remember your solar panel is going to be charging that battery every day. And if you have something that is either chronically undercharging a battery or chronically overcharging a battery, even by a little bit, you do that every day for the whole year, you could either undercharge and shorten the battery life. If you overcharge, you're gonna dramatically shorten your battery life. And so it's a way to make sure that your batteries, you have the maximum life of your batteries by having the right charge voltages. Here's another controller. That's one of the controllers I have on my boat. It's very compact. It's about maybe 10 centimeters long by five centimeters high by two centimeters wide. So these controllers are not these massive battery chargers that we have on our boat or inverters. These are tiny little devices. The other one that I was showing you is that the, M the 7515 is about this big. So on my boat, because I wanted to harness all the energy from the sun and I wanted 
to make sure that I got everything, I installed one controller per panel. And on my boat, I have a sailboat and I have all these various shading situations that could happen because of the boom, the radar pole, the backstays. There's all these different things that shades my panel differently. I decided that whatever happens to one panel that might be shaded, my other panel is going to be perfectly optimized to its controller. And so it allows me to harness more energy from the sun. And this is what it actually looks on my boat. I've got four controllers. You can barely see the one at the bottom. Four controllers going to a fuse block and then the fuse block going to um, the battery. So as uh, Gareth is going to start prepping himself right now, um, I'm just going to open the floor while he just gets ready. Does any of you have any questions or anything about what I've talked about before we start looking at the demo? So, yeah, I passed the MC4 cable round before and uh, plugs, you can have a look at them now, sort of just showing how they connect and disconnect. It's very simple. Um, I'll crimp them, strip the cable back and crimp the connections on. So best to use a sharp knife and obviously when you're using a sharp knife be careful that you keep your fingers clear of it. Um, this actually is like you can you can feed the cable right through so obviously you don't want to strip it back that full distance you just want to get enough to get under the crimping part which is this first sort of quarter inch on the solid bit on there um, and then same for the the male end there it's this one here you can feed the cable up more but you just it only has to really get under the the connection there And when you're doing this, try not to, like some people may use side cutters and go like that, but then you end up damaging right around that base where you've cut. And the strands, if you happen to catch them, they can snap off really easy. It can create a hot point. In solar, it's not so bad, but um, just yeah, in any crimping situation, try to use a knife and keep away from the cores as such. So that goes there. Sit that in, and then uh, it's a bit easier. With these ones here, they don't quite fit into the crimper, so I just normally push them in a little bit with, by hand. Get in there. Get that ready, and then slide it in. So the sheathing goes right to the edge of where the crimp's going to happen. Crimp down, check the connection, it's nice and tight, give it a tug to make sure. What size of crimp was it? Um, like, yes, yeah, so they were all color coded, but this is a slightly... Yeah, this is specific for these okay. um, crimps, so this tool, yeah, I don't know what it costs, but it's an actual MC4 ah. plug crimper, so you can't use one of the, okay. the standard color crimpers. And then these connectors, there's a little rubber grommet inside if you take that apart. So when you tighten this down, it clamps down and that creates the waterproofing from any ingress coming in that way. So you can leave that on when you're pushing this in. Um, I'll push it in and then you can hear a tiny click. That's when it's directly in. If you only put it in halfway and tighten this up, it's possible in the connection when you put them together that it's not, the other end's not going to connect properly and you'll have a bad connection, so I um, don't know if you can get in there. So, yeah, it's not really a click, it's more of, you can just feel it release and get caught in there, and then tighten that up so it's very watertight, give it a tug, and yeah, so that's is basically. There, is there any visual way you can tell that you've got it right? You can't um, it's. Or? Yeah, it's more the feeling of when you push it in and pull it before you tighten this up because then you, you'll know if you can pull it back out then it hasn't gone completely in. And yeah, that's, yeah. Um, I'll do the other one. 
Um, with solar panels as well, how the positive and negative plugs are sitting on them, a lot of people think it's convenient to plug them in to carry it. If you then go and put that solar panel in the sun, it's shorted. So, yeah, definitely don't do that for when you take, if you do take them off to store them, don't plug the ends into each other because you'd get, need to get a new solar panel. Yeah. Just slide it in so that's hard up. See how these flare out a little bit? That won't fit in the crimping tool, so just pinch that down again. Can be a little bit finicky when you first start doing these if trying to use only two hands to get it to sit in there properly and everything. So crimp it down. Good crimp again. If you're crimping up here, you've obviously got it in the wrong part of the crimper, and then that'll prevent it from clipping in, clicking in properly into the connector. So make sure you've only crimped down on the the securing part of the the pin there. And so the other end, don't crimp two of the same ones on if you because <laughs> you won't be able to plug your panel in. So same deal, just keep put that on and. That click there. And you said you could, you could tug at that point and make sure that, that, that it Yeah, so now I won't I won't be able to pull that out. So yeah. Um where'd those pins go? See on these pins, you can see all those little jagged bits there. That's what clicks in and prevents it from being able to be pulled out again. So if you have second thoughts or you haven't quite got it right, if you're committed, this connector is gone. Um, the pin will be, you can cut it out and yeah, basically start again with a new pin connector there and put it back in. Do you have an extractor that goes inside? Yeah, no, not if you've pushed it right, right yeah, in. Yeah, but I don't think, I've never seen it just a pin being sold, so. Yeah. It's sort of like an Ikea furniture, at one point there's certain parts you just can't buy Ikea furniture. Yes. Individual pieces, right. so yeah. it is what it is. Yeah. And then... Yeah, so when you have your panel up on the, the dodger, you just plug it in and when you disconnect, like that. So. But yeah, as I said, don't, when you have a solar panel, don't, when you go to store it, don't plug them into each other because yeah, if you bring it back out into the sunlight, you'll you need a new panel. Disconnect under load, is that just about sparking and arcing? Yeah, so the best way to disconnect your solar panel is cover it with a towel or something so it's not doesn't have any load trying to charge and yeah so it's like turning us it doesn't matter if the solar panel's in the sun then though does it if they're all completely uh, unplugged no but you you'd cover it before plugging it back in as well because right, yeah you don't want to you've unplugged it or it's completely disconnected you yeah it'd be fine as long as no one plugs them into each other yeah so how much for that Jim? Um, about 13 dollars or 10 dollars about 10 bucks for a pair for a pair is that a pair? Two. Well, that's one, but you get oh. so you buy them in pairs, so it's something like thirteen dollars. I can't remember. Yeah. It's not it's not a crazy price. And then when you're coming down the railing of your bimney or your dodger, um, we use this cable sock just to make it look nice, rather than having exposed cables. And that just goes round and tucks in nicely. If you get a heat gun on there, it actually tidies it up a little bit as well. You mount the ends in it. You can make it look a little bit nicer to just aesthetically, or you can fold fold the end in there and put a cable tie around it. And or heat yeah, shrink. You could even put yeah, a, heat shrink a, over a the cable end. Heat shrink on top. Yeah. yeah, that's what I did on my boat. Yeah, you know, you put heat shrink on top of it, it makes it right. really clean. Mm. It's more for aesthetic purposes, just so that people don't see cabling or wiring on a boat. Yeah, on the outside. So yes, that's pretty much it for the solar crimping and cabling on there. Um, I'll show you just some of the other crimps for your fusing and whatnot for inside the boat or if you're doing any, yeah, anything anywhere on the boat basically. We always use the heat shrink connectors just to help against corrosion and yeah, sort of extend the life of your connections. So stripping I can 
do it fairly well and know I'm not damaging the cables by going like this, but someone that hasn't done it before, if I push in too tight, pull out, you'll get some of the cores coming off. See the little strands? And that's obviously affecting the, the cable and you're degrading the rating of it that it's meant to carry. Show them how you would use this stripper. Yeah, that's kind so, of yes. So there's many different types of strippers, but this is the one we have here today. So it's 14 gauge cable. So just put it in the 14 gauge thing, crimp down and so that there won't damage any of the cores inside and you can get it the correct distance that you need to put inside the crimp kind of thing. So. Um, with your connectors, yellow is 10 and 12 gauge. Blue is 14 and 16 gauge and red is 18 to 22 gauge. So you don't want to be putting 14 gauge cable into a 1210 connector because the connection is not going to be as it's designed for. So, um, I stripped that a little bit long there but I'll just cut it down. So just the butt splice connector here. Wrap the strands around just so there's no strays so when you're pushing it in they don't sort of flare up and not get inside the actual tunnel of the connector there and then these crimpers are color coded so reds for that the small 18 to 22 blue is 14 and they correspond with with the crimps and yellow is 10 to 12 so do the 14 to 16 crimp it down. This one here is a single crimp. You can also get another version of these crimpers that has double crimp which is ideal because then you have two points of connection. Give it a tug to make sure it's all connected correctly and then there's no point buying a heat shrink connector if you don't melt it down. I've gone onto numerous boats where people have them but they don't have a gas torch or maybe too scared not knowing if there's vapours or something around. do this evenly because otherwise you can scorch the cable and damage the actual sheathing and it would it'll go black and that's deteriorated the the cable so if it goes into oil or gets some kind of grease on it over time that may possibly affect the cable so now that's you're going to pass that around might still be a little bit hot just <laughs> there's, a, there's a version i think it's a consumer brand of, of, crimp, of, of heat shrink connectors but it also has glue inside or silicone or something yeah, uh, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Is that overkill? Or no. Or no, no, it's just, you know, it's like anything, there's no end. Yeah. You know, I, 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 it's not, I wouldn't say it's an overkill, but you're certainly going to buy that at, at, at multiples what you charge for a nylon connector. So, I mean, at one point, you got to ask yourself, it's diminishing returns. Right. right? I, I think this is probably a good start. And I've often wondered why, why, why bilge pumps have this much wire on and you're doomed to be in an incredibly wet location forever. That's too short of a wire. It should be much longer. That's because it's been cut and cut. I mean, the bilge pump wiring is generally about at least this long, and you've got to get it as high as humanly possible. And you're right, it's essential with a bilge pump, essential to use an absolute heat shrink connection, and perfectly because having 12 volts going into your bilge with some metals that are going to be underwater, you can have 12 volts going to ground because pretty much your whole boat is grounded. And so you can have then a circuit in your boat and in your bilge. So uh, yeah, a, a bilge pump wiring absolutely has to be sealed and cannot be laying in the bilge with open connectors. Um, Nigel Calder has stories of a bilge pump float switch failing and causing a keel to drop. The bolts got all chewed up. So you cannot have a circuit in your boat in the bilge, in the water, because I mean, a lot of those water is going to be underwater metals, and they're pretty much all grounded. So it's very, very serious to have bilge wiring that is not shield, not properly uh, heat shrunk, so that there's no more moisture or water that can get into that, complete the circuit. So if with the heat shrink connectors, it also matters exactly what crimp you're using. These ones here basically are universal, so I could use it on the 1210, I can use it on the 1618, I can use it on the red 18 to 22. But when I crimp down with this, it actually penetrates through the heat shrink. So the metal is exposed there. So if it does 
get in that situation if it's for a bilge pump. You've used a heat shrink connector, but because it's the metal has actually basically made it null and void having heat shrink on it, you may as well just have a straight metal crimp there. Yeah, so, yeah, make sure you don't use the wrong tool for the. Gary, show them the. Uh, that's the one I have on my boat. That's an FTZ uh, crimper, ratcheted yeah. crimper that's made for. Uh, heat shrink insulation. Yes. It will never break. Some of the crimpers, there's such rough edges that they actually pierce and actually cause the heat shrink to actually be sliced open. So um, this ratchet crimper is designed by FTZ, who also make a lot of heat shrink connectors, and it actually is kind of like you'll notice the edges are, you know, they're kind of round and smooth. Right, they're not jagged, straight yeah. edges. And so it allows the crimp to be done without actually uh, severing the heat shrink insulation. Yeah, which those crimpers, that type of crimpers do. Because yeah, normally these are cheaper as well, the, the type, obviously, because it's not designed specifically for it. People think, oh, I don't want to spend $30 on a crimper, I'll get a $10 pair. So yeah, these crimpers here, it's got the color gauges there again for the different size. So this is the 1012. Crimp it down. Oh, slid off. Yeah. I slide. clearly haven't used these ones. <laughs> yes, well. Yeah, the problem is the when yeah, you do so. a double crimp, some of the barrels are shorter yeah. and it varies from manufacturer to manufacturer. And it's hard to do a double crank on those because sometimes the barrel it slopes and it slides. So it's really, yeah. it's, it's even tricky. Yeah. yeah. So even though the price of some of these crimpers can be up to $100, depending how many crimps you need to do on your boat, it would pay to get a better, a good pair because if you, know, you want to spend $20 and get a pair like this, you're not really doing yourself any favours by trying to crimp heat shrink connectors with something that's going to, damage them as such. So. Um. Over time, this is the one I have on my own boat, and it is tricky to use, but over time, you get used to it, and then it never, never breaks the seal on your heat shrink terminals. Yeah. So these, this Angkor one is designed for the specific Angkor um, lugs as well. Well, these are FTZ, but yeah, you can get pretty much identical lugs of these of Angkor, and they're designed for exactly that purpose, crimping the, the lugs on those. But. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Enjoy the rest of the show. Thanks, Gareth. That's right.